Um, so I'm now delighted to introduce our speaker today. We have Wenhu Song, and Wenhu is a professor of biomaterials and medical engineering at UCL. She is also the head of the UCL Center for Biomaterials in Surgical Reconstruction and Regeneration. She specializes in nanomaterials, macromolecular materials, nanocomposites and biomanufacturing for tissue engineering, biosensors and drug delivery. Professor Song also leads research in the development of artificial tissues and organs, implantable biosensors or devices and regenerative medicine. So thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Song. Just before I hand over to you, we would like to run a quick poll to see what the audience's thoughts are on the following. You should see your polls coming up soon. If you are asked to make a choice of an organ replacement, which types would you prefer? You've got one choice and your options are a human donor's organ, an animal organ, a bionic implant, a lab grown organ, or none of them. Thank you guys. Okay, so we can see from the results, the most popular choice is human donor's organ. And then we've got an animal organ, slightly fewer votes. And then second most popular, a lab grown organ, which would be quite interesting. Bionic implants up there for 8% and none of them 2%. Some of you out here are like, nope, we don't want any organ replacements. We'll just take the medicine that's out here. So let's speak to Dr. Wen, Dr. Song and see what she has for us. So Dr. over to you, Dr. Song. Brilliant. Thank you, Vitas, uh, uh, for the introduction. And uh, good evening, everybody, uh, everyone, audience. I'm so glad to see so many audience to join this seminar. It's been great pleasures to be here to talk about, um, to share our research in the development of synthetic tissue organ. Um, let's just move on. I don't know what's wrong with oh um we uh, we are in the uh, aging popul uh, aging population society as the poll showed that most of you prefer majority right prefer the uh, organ uh, donors to, uh, transplant um this is golden standard uh, surgical treatment in the uh, clinical side at the moment um, unfortunately, because of the aging population and sometimes there are more um, unfortunate uh, trauma on the sur cancer surgical treatment, we need more organ. If you look at uh, this uh, um, diagram, although a little bit dated from the US Department of Health and Human Service, the trend is still constantly the same. You can see there's a long waiting list for organ transplantation. And unfortunately, the, the donor, the, the transplants available or uh, happened is more or less saturated, means we need more donors, more organs, but it's not realistic. When we look at latest data from the UK side, you can see the most needed organ is from the kidney, followed with liver, heart and the lung uh, and other uh, uh, organs. And the, it hasn't current clinical practice and the supply won't be able to meet all the uh, increasing need even for the patient who are lucky uh, to have the matched uh, human donor organ uh, most likely would still suffer from the immune rejection need a long life a lifelong uh, drug uh, uh, support uh, although there's a serious side effect Currently, uh, not surprised that most of the audience don't uh, choose the um, animal organ uh, because there's potential, this cross species transmission from the virus and the disease to the human, and it's not com compatible either. Um, so what about this bionic uh, implant? You probably see some of the implant available. Uh, in general, it has a poor biocompatibility in the engineering system does failed as other uh, engineering products uh, you use like computers it failed sometimes and what about the lab growth organ i'm surprised that there are 17 uh, percent of the uh, proportions choose this um, um, choice and let's see what happening at the moment and these are the latest uh, artificial heart I can see from the literature made by a French company Comet, and it has still state-of-the-art plastic-based uh, artificial heart 
uh, in, use the polyurethane as the uh, chamber and housing those electronic system and um, pumping system. Um, from this quite old news from the BBC 10 years ago, uh, Mr. Uh, Matthew Green, he, could, he couldn't have the uh, transplant heart and he, he was implanted with this artificial um, heart, plastic heart. Um, from the doctor, you can see uh, from the news, he has to carry this seven kilograms of the portable device, the driver, the, the batteries to, to drive his uh, new heart. Um, you could imagine he's definitely not that mobile. And, and this definitely is not ideal, but these are the current state of the art development. So what we need for, um, for the building this lab grows uh, biological functional tissue organ. Uh, we normally talk to the student about three pillars. Um, we need the cells. We need the cells which are the living part, um, generate the uh, proteins, uh, repair the tissue. And we also need a scaffold which can house the cells. In the meantime, uh, guiding, uh, modeling the cell behaviors and uh, help supporting the cell um, uh, growth and the differentiation. And eventually we wish the, uh, the scaffold would fade away, degrade and replaced by regenerative tissue. And this is other um, holy gray wish list that we want to do. And, and they would need a buy information to connect them together. Those are the single known pathway and cell-cell interaction and also all the uh, biologically, biofunction, mechanically stimulation um, to make system work. We also need the ena enable technologies to support, to manufacturing all the cells and scaffold and to implement it with the, the system. And we need that these products are reproducible, cost effective and safe. All this wish list um, is need to be in one place and connected. Unfortunately, at the moment, those jigsaw puzzles has, hasn't been well uh, implemented and tissue engineering um, although has been going on for decades um, and there are lots of uh, medium hypes perhaps going on um, but you can see we still couldn't answer each of the question I see lots of uh, uh, audience ask the similar questions uh, do we have a, a cells renewable do we have the suitable materials can the scaffold generate the vascular system to support nutrition transportation integrated with the human body system? Is it reproducible? Is it safe? Any uh, ethical issue? What about the cost? All those bombarded questions we couldn't really answer at the moment. Um, let's look at the current uh, uh, development we have in the scientific community. Um, First of all, we're talking about the cell source we have, stem cell. Stem cell bring uh, those hope to us to see we might potentially have this renewable, uh, uh, producible cells available uh, to generate tissue organ because it has the potential to differentiate into different type of the cell and the tissue in the end. And it has different type of the a stem cell, and you probably heard of this embryonic stem cell, there's an ethical issue. And uh, um, the uh, multipotent stem cell, which is uh, the, the, the can extract it from the human being, um, they are like a um, miso common stem cell uh, from bone marrow or from the adipose, the fat, and um, also can be from the blood. Um, and the recent years, you probably heard some of these called iPS stem cells uh, through the um, lab uh, uh, inventions to, to re, re reprogram the cell into the uh, stem cell. Um, as I said, this uh, Mr. Common stem cells is not new. It has been in the clinical practice. Um, some of the clinical trial already ongoing. Um, the, they are the so far probably uh, most accessible stem cell we have in the research lab as well. And we can reasonably good to reproduce them. Unfortunately, this type of the stem cell, um, they are not selective. 
um, they they could have they have limited differentiation to the specific tissue as well. And they're also donor dependent, which means if you have different age of the donors, the, the cell has different multipotential or they have different uh, potential differentiation into specific tissue organ. So although it's the cell available and accessible, but they also is still expensive and their current clinical outcome is not predictable. It varies. And uh, we uh, um, put all the hope to the IPS stem cell recent years since the development by Japanese scientist, Professor Yamanaka and uh, his team developed this amazing four transgene factor cocktail to revert the uh, adult cell, uh, adult cell, for instance, from the skin or blood to convert it into the uh, uh, embryonic like kind of uh, uh, pluripotent stem cell. And you can see this video here I uh, used from the public, published papers. These are the cardiomyocyte cells derived from the human IPS cell and it's beating in the culture dish. And this has been amazing a breakthrough to change the development biology in the textbook. You probably learned cells tend to go from young to the to old, and through the IPS uh, cocktail uh, uh, median, you can revert from the old adult cell into the young, have those uh, uh, pluripotent differentiation capacity, and the, this has been developed an enormous benefit for all the uh, regenerative community. And you, you can imagine by reproduce this kind of uh, IPS cell just from the adults and patient itself. So you, you can grow the tissue from patient's own. And, and now Jap Japan and the UK as well develop this uh, IPS cell bank stocking the cell lines from the super donor, the healthy super donors. And it means you could have unlimited supplies in the future as well. And um, those who would remove all the ethical issues uh, using the uh, embryonic stem cell. Um, however, despite of this, um, we have to be aware there are some limitations. Uh, so far, at least from our lab, it, it's very hard to uh, to afford to do in this IP cell line based tissue engineering development because it's so expensive. It costs so much and time consuming. And in the meantime, it has limitation of the low uh, efficiencies reprogramming. So you might end up with different type of the cells in one batch. And also there's a safety risk um, because you use the virus or these transgene factors, and they're probably quite high risk to develop genetic disease, for instance, like a cancer. Um, another emerging uh, cell source is direct reprogramming. And um, from this uh, type of the technology, it uh, proves the sum of the uh, feasibilities you could potentially directly pro reprogram the adult cell into the, the, the stem cell uh, without going through the IPS. This could potentially cheaper and faster to avoid this uh, uh, multi-steps. However, this is the early stage, like uh, you probably heard this CRISPR gene uh, editing, and it would be more precisely to edit the cells uh, in this way, and that could bring the new hope for more uh, renewable, sustainable type of the cell line. And one type of the engineering cell I'm particularly interested in, I like to highlight here is the optogenetic stem cell. Um, and that means you can program type of the light sensitive molecules, for, for instance, it's channel dopsins into the cell, iPS stem cell or um, embryonic stem cell you can do. And then you can activate the neuron, for instance, uh, by the light. Um, my, my collaborators, Dr. Uh, Evo Liberen in the King's College, we collaborate working together, try to build this neuromuscular junction through this engineering approach. Um, so when we have this amazing uh, new cell type uh, development, um, does this mean so we, we could build the whole tissue organ? The, the answer is still not yet. Um, even 
um, you probably heard or you see this uh, uh, medians has this desolarized scaffold, which uh, keep the whole geometry structure of the stru uh, the ECM, the actual cellular matrix, and it, it's still not trivial to re the to the whole heart back again. Um, so what is this current um, uh, issue hurdles uh, hurdles we we have to uh, uh, over overcome one of the areas i'm particularly interested in our lab is when we look at this complex system for each type of the organ you can see those um here radical multi steps of the self organization of the tissue organ um from the uh, macro scale down to the micro nano scale so you can see nature are uh, self organized into the this uh, hierarchical structures and the cell to housing the cell so cell need a scaffold need a, a scaffold with biological function to provide uh, a micro environment and the macro structures in, in order to make the functional tissue organ. And there are lots of research going on to make to invent new biomaterials, to make materials not only biocompatible and more bioactive or biofunctional by introducing uh, programming different uh, protein molecules together to make the materials more close to the ECM, this e e e the uh, extracellular like materials. In the meanwhile, um, there are lots of development in the enabled technology. You can see this uh, uh, chat, you can see over the years, each type of the engineering inventions to bring this uh, um, revolution of the medical diagnosis and the treatment. Um, in our uh, medical science and engineering. Um, now you, you heard a lot about 3D printing, um, and then whether this can bring new revolution to the surgical treatment or the medical regenerative or medicine. One thing is promising, this disruptive technologies uh, change the manufacturing in the past is you don't need a, a mode expensive mode, you don't need a tuning system to produce the product. You can just print the um, structure which have a same uh, anatomical structure from the medical scan the image which invented in the uh, past not long ago. And there are many type of the 3D printing technology around us. And I don't have time to mention each of them, but I like to highlight some of the amazing development in recent years to see how this bioprinting, printing hydrogel, printing the cell with the hydrogel has been developed and how this capacity could lend us to the future development. And you, you probably have already seen those amazing applications in the medical side through the 3D printing. You can print a bespoke uh, implant, FDA already approved uh, for uh, this uh, um, uh, facial implant and a, and a new implant uh, use the metal materials and the facial implant use this plastic materials. And this already in the place, and the surgeon also in, implemented with those uh, um, rapid prototyping by this 3D printing to make this assistant in, uh, devices to improve their uh, orthopedic uh, surgical um, uh, uh, treatment in uh, doing this in the theater, and they, and they are also. Um, lots of uh, bespoke, stylish uh, prosthesis uh, going on. And doctor also use this for the training purposes to practice their surgical skill. And the uh, scientists start to print in cells and uh, uh, soft tissue organ in the lab. And I, I like to show one of the, um, my favorite uh, papers published by the uh, American uh, scientists in the Rice University. You can see they develop this uh, uh, hydrogel, uh, which is uh, more biocompatible. And in the meantime, um, they build this beautiful uh, vascular network system, which allow using this digital light, light uh, process uh, controlled to print this complicated 
an interconnected uh, vascular network. This is uh, amazing to look at how engineering, how the 3D printing can do, which con conventional manufacturing won't be able to, to make such complicated structure. And it has demonstrated proof of concept how this vascular system, like a little mimic, a little nun to exchange oxygen. Um, these are not, there's another um, publication recent years is printing the heart tissue. Um, here is demonstrated by um, similar printing technique, um, and then you'll be able to quickly manufacture the geometry uh, like a heart, and by incorporate with the patient patient cells they can print the piece of the tissue. It's not as the whole heart. And then you will be able to see the function, the beating of the tissue and the morphology of the tissue. Those are the latest scientific uh, advancement in this field. And then back to uh, what we are doing here uh, at uh, UCL. Um, our center um, is based in the Royal Free Hospital. We are part of the division of the surgery and the interventional science. We set up a lab to develop new, new biomaterials, develop new biomanufacturing technique, to develop a new implant, new devices or scaffold for tissue regeneration. And in the meanwhile, we work with our clinical colleagues and, try, and the industry to try to translate our research to the clinical application. Um, one of the areas I've just briefly mentioned, the, the materials side of development, we are interested in to develop the uh, polymer nanocomposite, which has the abilities to self-assemble and respond to different uh, stimulation. Um, we uh, inspiring from the nature, when you look at the uh, nature, this self-assembling is the the nature design principle and the cell assemble themselves the membrane with different molecules and, and form the ECM uh, structure into the hierarchical fibers. And the bone is another amazing nano composite to combine with uh, uh, collagen fiber and the uh, inorganic nanoparticles. And in our lab, what we want to do is we want to find the, those engineering tool to uh, speed up this na nature process. So we try to understand what's the uh, control parameters allowed us to assemble the materials with the cell together to accelerate the tissue and, uh, uh, organ growth. And we have been working on this uh, self-assembling materials for many years. We work on the liquid-crystalline polymers and uh, assemble these carbon nanotubes, nanomaterials, and understand the self-assembling behavior. One of the ongoing projects here I like to share is uh, made uh, working by um, Dr. Ji Sudan Chen, who is also orthopedic surgeon, and he's uh, interesting to look at the uh, lab grew uh, hydroxyapatite nanoparticles, which is part of the similar structure as the bone, and to understand that this uh, geometry type of the nanoparticles can form the ordered structure by self-assembling and how these ordered structures can guide, guide the uh, cell, for instance, like a bone marrow, mesocommon stem cell, to differentiate into the bone and give us a scientific answer how we can um, guide the cell to generate more ordered structures like a native bone does. Um, another uh, interesting project I like to highlight is done by Amy. She's founded by BBSRC Lido um, Interdisciplinary Doctor Training Program, and she's working on this light driven um, muscle, synthetic muscle. And what she's doing right now, we incorporate with Dr. Libran, I mentioned previously, working on this uh, optogenetics um, uh, um, modifying the stem cell. And she has made this uh, um, hyperelastic uh, polymers, which show amazing hyperelasticities, have a similar mechanical match as the uh, 
muscle tissue. And what she's come up with, and she made the nanofiber, and then she find uh, this kind of the morphology can um, guide the uh, myofiber, uh, myotube formation faster and stabilize them even in the, this neuromuscular circus uh, in the culture dish. And this, this has showed last longer compared with the control. And which is remind me in the probably few uh, last decades, and there's a striking images in the science magazine cover, uh, covered uh, uh, paper. You can see there's a, a artificial arm wrestling uh, with the uh, human arm. And then when you, um, right now we are looking at maybe in the near futures, you can have light therapy to gain the stronger muscle through the uh, muscle stem cell. Um, we also incorporate with the 3D printing technique. 3D printing is amazing, but it can't print every single type of the materials. And we combined with the, um, the coagulation phase separation of the polymer and develop this 3D uh, process, which allowed us to print any both a bespoke soft uh, construct, allowed to make this hierarchical structure. Um, through the printing uh, soluble mode, water soluble mode, and it will be able to inject those polymer or different type of the formulations to make this uh, different ki kind of construct. Here just show you how the engineering capacity can do by generate macro structure shape with complex geometry. And then you can control those uh, uh, Macro pore uh, and micro nano pores through the uh, process, and then also control the nano structure uh, through the different uh, parameter conditions to make this uh, engineering based hierarchical scaffold. And it has, we also find that this you can tune in the mechanical properties uh, of the stiffness of the scaffold, which is mimic the body stiffening and the relaxation. Um, there's uh, uh, physiological by uh, the response after surgical uh, treatment or uh, the injury. Um, this tip scaffold show a, a very interesting um, by compatibility to in, to promote the cell proliferation in the real three D. Uh, structure, you can see beautiful 3D uh, confocal imaging to show how cell uh, grew through uh, out the whole structure of the scaffold. And in the, we implant this in the rat, and you can actually also see uh, this interesting vascular system grew followed the printed channel. And this tell us this printing technology would allow you to um, manipulate and guide the uh, vascular system uh, grow inside the uh, body. And we made this uh, uh, interesting uh, airway construction to demonstrate the feasibility of the scaffold and to make a, a airway. It's a very hard, uh, challenging tissue. It, although it, it looks quite humble in terms of the structure, but it's actually very complex. And you can see also appreciate how critical this organ is, particularly uh, during this pandemic period. Um, you, you need a cartilage to form this structure. In the meanwhile, have the soft tissue connected form the, this unique tubular structure. In the meantime, and you need the epithelial layer inside, which you build uh, through this uh, dedicated uh, cilia um, with the uh, globular functional cells to um, to work together and have those biological functions which allowed you breathing properly and also prevent all the bacteria and the um, uh, virus uh, from go inside of the body. And we proved that we could grow the cartilage uh, using the bone marrow mesocommon stem cell uh, based on this type of the scaffold. And we also grew this beautiful cilias on top of this scaffold and with different uh, cell type co-culture. We can see those multi-layered of uh, mimic tissues have more matured uh, cilia formation and the mucus, uh, mucus uh, the globular cell development as well. And you can see those uh, uh, and beautiful cilia hair uh, little uh, uh, structures on the 
uh, scanning electron microscope. And the, another uh, project uh, which uh, is doing by um, Nahim Yakub, uh, he is also BBSRC uh, LIDO uh, PhD founded uh, student, and he's interesting to take this more adventurous study to encapsulate the cell uh, into the 3D by the 3D printing to develop this model, the, the trachea model, a long model um, for drug screening. And potentially it could also be used for uh, tissue repair. And he, he chose this uh, uh, peptide gel, which is synthetic uh, made and has a better controlled uh, in terms of the composition structure. And he's making uh, lots of progress uh, in this uh, um, um, project. Um, finally, I, I would like to show this uh, another development by another PhD student, KJ Tai, and he has working on this collagen-based scaffold, which allowed you to print into all kinds of uh, complex geometry. Um, we all know collagen is one of the fundamental proteins in our body is in uh, this extracellular matrix. And, uh, and it's actually very hard to pro reprocess the collagen after extracted from all the biological tissue. And this is even harder to print them. And this exciting development has allowed us to print this collagen hydrogels into all complex geometry demonstrated here. And I think this is going to be another interesting platform and to further develop to validate the function and incorporate with the cell. Um, so, so far I showed some of this, the uh, showcase of what we have done and the, what the uh, other community uh, in, the, in these areas have done so far. And uh, I have to say, we're still facing many challenges. As I mentioned in the beginning, um, we still uh, haven't found all the fully functional biological materials and uh, uh, printing, printing the by ink. And the cell is still the uh, issue. Where is the most uh, sustainable uh, cell resource uh, source we should uh, approach? And uh, and the rest probably even harder to uh, to actually complement in the end. Have a patient specific. Do we have? Do we need a big uh, bioreactors to? Through the tissue and then transplant to the patient in the end, whether this uh, is soluble, this is state stability, reproducibility, and then you come up with uh, uh, enormous the challenges, this, whether you have standardized the uh, uh, regulation system in the place. So all this so far, I would say we, we won't be able to answer all of this question, but we make a, a step a change. Um, uh, by step by step change. Um, one thing I'm, I'm, I'm proud of is we uh, this is 3D tip uh, uh, approach, which we had contribute one of the uh, passion case development in the Great Ormond Street Hospital. And this uh, little uh, uh, baby patient who has this uh, terrible laryngosteronosis, and we develop this. Um, soft stand which supporting the surgical reconstruction and the uh, post-surgical healing. Um, this is something we are uh, uh, proud to work with the surgeon to, to make our development useful and contribute to save the life. Um, and this is something, uh, although it's not regenerative uh, in the purpose, but it's something that can be applied, uh, which is really uh, amazing. Um, before I, I finish my talk, I like to uh, share some of this uh, um, future perspective development for your thought. Um, one is uh, we, I mentioned this gene editing, and uh, also late, recent years there's huge development with the artificial intelligence, and uh, there, there's a future. I can see we, we can go, we will be more, more capable to program the materials and the cells. And in this case, we might avoid this, all the mass uh, engineering exercise to grow the cells, to uh, develop the materials. And, and in the future, so we might have those uh, real uh, programmed, controlled 
uh, engineering construct. Um, in the short term, I think this uh, um, animal um, um, organs might be possible. Um, I read the news uh, from this uh, uh, Casper gene editing. Um, scientists already demonstrate they can remove this uh, virus gene in the uh, peak and uh, and then grew the uh, and then have the farm to 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 have a, a grew the organs from the pig and so potentially this in has already in the stage of the in vivo study and and it looks like in the near future so we might have those animal organs which are safer than before uh, uh to in the uh, put, put, uh, as an alternative of a human donor um and the, the finally uh, i'm a scientist so i have more things on the we call the bio artificial organ and um, it will be the hybrid device look at this uh, artificial liver um from this side these are the engineering external device to housing uh, this uh, haptocyte is liver, one of the liver cells, either from animal or from human original. And it, it is already in the uh, clinical theaters to support the patient. The other image here, you can see this little creature is actually made from autogenetic um, cardiomyocyte and uh, encapsulated by the silicon hydrogel. And, uh, and these little creatures can swim um, in, in response to the light. So you can you can see in the futures, we might be able to generate, to de design or produce something might not be exactly like the liver or like the heart, but they are functional. They are biofunctional working together through the engineering approach with the biological uh, functional cells. Um, so, I stopped here. I'd like to thank all my team who uh, working on various of the project and contribute each uh, small steps of the development. We are excited with those achievement. And also all my collaborators from UCL and the other uh, um, uh, university. Um, my uh, thanks also go to general sponsors from the uh, council and from charity, from the industry. And thank you for all your audience. Thank you. Bye. Uh, thanks. Sorry. That's from me. Thank you so much, Professor Song, for such a fascinating lecture. And I mean, seeing some of the work that you're doing and watching it being applied is really amazing. So thank you so much for that. So for everybody else, before we jump into the Q&A, we thought it'd be interesting to see if your opinions have changed following today's lecture. So we're gonna run the two polls again, and we're gonna see, get you guys to submit your answers and see again, if you are asked to make a choice of an organ replacement, which types would you prefer? The poll should be coming up soon. You should see the options. There you go. So a human donor's organ, an animal organ, a bionic implant, a lab grown organ or none of them again. So give you guys a few seconds to answer that and we'll have a look. Okay, so our results are up. Our most popular option, we've got this time a little bit of a change. We've got our most popular option is a lab grown organ. So obviously you'd be listening along to what Professor Song was saying and seeing actually might be better to approach that there. And we've got our second favorite is a human donor's organ again. And then the other three options just coming a little bit further down still there. Um, so now it is time to have another go at our Twitter poll again. So the question is, is the lab grown organ the future of organ replacement? You've got yes, no, and not sure. So have a go at that question. Let's see if those results are coming up. There we go. So massive change this time, guys. We've got yes, astoundingly by 90%. And then quite a few people now are in the not sure. We've got 9% there and then just the 1% on no. So clearly that topic and the discussion with Dr. Song has obviously changed quite a few minds. So let's have a look now at the participants. We've got amazingly over 400 people with us today, which is just amazing. Thank you guys for joining us. And we're going to move on to the Q&A. You've been submitting your questions in there. So we're going to put them questions to Professor Song and see what answers we might come, come out with. Let's have a look. So our first question in there for Professor Song is, are there many ethical problems with growing these types of organs? 
Hi, and um, very good question. I think these are the uh, big issues concerned by all the people and not only uh, from the uh, patient and the patient's family members and the whole society. I think the, the main purpose of the growing synthetic organ is try to avoid this potential ethical issue and we will be able to make a patient specific uh, of the cell source, uh, which also will be less immune rejection in the meanwhile, completely uh, eliminated the potential ethical issues from the uh, user and bionic on other possible resources. So this, this, uh, this is something, um, the aim of the synthetic organ. Thank you. And I think the next question ties in quite nicely with that, which is, would the body ever reject the manufactured organs? So depending on what steps, um, cell type you've used. At the moment, I think body reject every invader, and no matter even even the uh, human donor organ, um, it will reject even they have a well matched. Um, uh, the assessment before you have a transplantation. Um, and then the synthetic organ has different immune response. And um, at the moment, I think scientists has already made some interesting development to try to uh, make a specific type of the materials which can uh, avoid the immune response. This is happening by just changing, for instance, this scientific paper published in the Nature Biology to change the college, uh, gel, um, um, alginate, which is a kind of a, a seaweed, and uh, allowed to avoid immune response means you can deliver the drug to the site without cause immune response. Um, this is ongoing, and also develop the implant has a specific geometry surface to avoid the immune response, to reduce the fibrosis. So this is ongoing. I think there are some exciting development in the synthetic organ uh, scaffold. Yeah, I mean, that sounds honestly amazing. So from the things you've mentioned, obviously bioprinting is a really important element that we're discovering more about. And one of the questions actually is, is bioprinting the only way to grow artificial organs or part of, does it have to be involved for the scaffold? Um, uh, good question. I think it's 3D printing. It just gives us enormous capacities to demonstrate a, a fast prototyping, the geometry, the construct you can have, which is a, a, the traditional method that we won't be able to do. And um, so definitely this is a powerful tools for lab and for industry in the future as well. Um, and uh, uh, the other existing technology, the manufacturing obviously still uh, uh, still very important. I think in the future, if we develop something which is more suitable for mass production and uh, both 3D printing and the, the, this conventional manufacturing still would be in the place. They are, they are not uh, compete each other. I think they were going to be work together. Okay, thank you very much. So another question we have in the chat is, someone was wondering, how are the mesenchymal stem cells extracted from healthy people? Um, very, very interesting question. I'm not searching, I'm the scientist. So I understand most common ones, the mesenchymal, uh, bone, bone marrow mesenchymal stem cell, this need to have donors uh, to, to, to take those uh, uh, from your spinal cord and uh, to uh, and then and then proliferate the cell extract the cell from the uh, donor's tissue and um, but there's another more popular one which is adipose stem cell uh, which is extracted from the fat tissue this become more popular and become more probably sustainable and easy to uh, resource from the, the fat tissue um, and this has been developed very quickly. The limitation for this type of the mesocommon stem cell is they have specific, specific uh, differentiation lineage, so it's not applied for all the tissues. Thank you. Um, so leading to that then, the another question is, can you also use platelet-derived stem cells instead of just mesenchymal stem cells, which would be easier than bone to harvest than bone marrow stem cells. 
I think so. There, there's also research going on in this direction. Again, um, you, in in the in the scientific community, is already demonstrated you can uh, reverse back to the iPS uh, protein stem cell uh, using all kinds of the cell resource. This is definitely yes, but whether to direct the programming to the specific tissue and this type of the cell might have limited choice. Brilliant. So I'm going to move on to a few more like overarching field type questions. We've got one that's asking, what is the scientific progress in the field of growing organs in the lab? Is the success rate desirable and is it currently legal slash regulated and approved in different regulatory systems? Right. Um, this the tissue engineering uh, scientific research activity has going on all over the world. It has been uh, uh, thriving over the years for decades, and the the development for this area is actually uh, together correlated with the cell development, cell technology, and those are the biological community to develop more uh, renewable, sustainable cells, and those are the one of the components in the tissue engineering side. And the, the, I think this will be back to the previous questions of whether this, those cell sources are uh, eth eth ethically approved. And the, um, again, if we remove away, I think now all people try to re remove away from embryonic, and this would uh, avoid that ethical issue um, by develop the uh, cell uh, from the IPS uh, or from the adult cell, we won't have that issue. Okay, thank you. So we've got people wondering kind of based on what's already out there and how the, the field is developing, could this be used to treat diseases like Alzheimer's disease and paralysis? So I'm getting a lot of neurodegenerative and muscular conditions. Would this be something that we could use and see in the clinic in the future? I think so. Uh, the the one I showed the slides with uh, this is just one of the example uh, to uh, the gene editing. I think definitely would have an amazing uh, development in in terms of this genetic disease. Um, and then the potential for other uh, maybe not tissue engineering at this stage is the through the gene gene therapy as well to uh, directly deliver the uh, correct gene uh, to the disease side. Um, in, the field, in, in terms of the uh, tissue engineering side, I think what we are interested in is to develop, develop this tissue model, which is difficult to assess from the patient, for instance, the brain, the neuromuscular junction, and those tissue, the, your, the eye, and those tissue are difficult to to have the proper uh, appropriate model and those tissue engineering already in the uh, further development to build this patient specific model, use the iPS cell and to help with drug screening and all the in vivo test to avoid the in vivo test. Yeah, absolutely. I know that the development of in silico, like computer versions and lab ex vivo models is something that's really trying to develop. And hopefully some of you on the call today are gonna to be the future scientists who are gonna be developing that and really helping pave the way to this tech engineering, this whole field really progressing the way we wanna see it, which kind of leads to an extra plug that we can give here. Someone's asked, which um, is UC, what is UCL's biggest achievement so far in terms of growing organs in the lab and just in the tissue engineering field generally? Dr. Professor Song, what do you think we've done so far? Sorry, do you talk about the, um, our lab or is the in general? In general, it could be your lab personally or it could be both. Or give us an example of both actually would be great. Um, right. Um, I think in, in general, um, the achievement uh, mainly is down to, um, uh, I think the bone bone uh, tissue regeneration, the structure tissue has been amazingly developed from different type of the scaffold and make the bone regenerative. They are like a by a glass, they are degradable, and the uh, and, uh, hydroxy appetite is, uh, to uh, also have a composite to make the, 
the implant. And those are, I think, particularly this regenerative tissue repair for heart tissue bone. This has already been the clinical application. Uh, I think this is probably already amazing achievement to look at to uh, the tissue engineering by combination was with the biomaterials and the cells to develop this regenerative uh, repair uh, therapy. Um, the, 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 this is one of the example. And the, in, in our lab, obviously the, the one we are doing still a little bit distance from the uh, actual application. But as I demonstrated, we could, those scaffold the implant could be, have a, a faster a, a pathways to, to go to the clinical application, not exactly the uh, cell implemented uh, construction, but the scaffold itself already probably have a, a fast track to go to the clinical application. Brilliant, thank you. So we have a bit more of a course specific question. So I'm guessing there's some people out here who are looking to maybe apply to UCL or do particular courses. The question is, which undergrad course at UCL would you recommend taking to go into regenerative medicine? Right, and um, you would have a, a, a different choices. If you want to uh, be a medical doctor, this would be your study medicine, and also lots of uh, uh, medical doctor will work on the regenerative medicine. And if you like to go to science engineering, um, and even in our uh, school of the uh, medical uh, life science, and we have the course for uh, medical engineering, and this these are the uh, the proper course you can take to to pursue this type of the career. Uh, and the, we we have other um, uh, module course running from different department, which also related with regenerative uh, therapy uh, related. And in the engineering uh, side of the uh, faculty, they also run in this tissue engineering, more from the engineering approach. Thank you, Professor Song. And I mean, on a personal student basis as well, there's quite a lot of this that we do on my course as well. So really, if you're in the Faculty of Medical Sciences, the chances are you'll get to do some work on regenerative medicine. And you can really focus that more and more as you go further into your academic career and refine the modules that you're interested in. Um, so we've just got a couple more minutes left. I'm gonna ask you a question that I think is a bit of a sci-fi question. I don't know if you have the answer. Maybe it'll get the audience thinking a little bit. The question is, could we grow a brain in the lab? And if so, could we stimulate it to become conscious? Um, there are tissue model uh, grew the brain tissue uh, in the culture dish. This, this has demonstrated how to this uh, brain tissue um, by in, incorporate with, with the stem cell uh, already in in the in the place or proved the concept. Um, but I am not aware this. Uh, further functional development, but certainly the, the tissue would respond with different stimuli. Absolutely. And I mean, that question kind of takes us into a whole realm of different possible topics about what even is consciousness and everything else. But really, I think it's very interesting. And thank you so much again, Professor Song, for your talk. So sadly, we're running out of time, so we're going to need to leave it there. However, if you guys could please provide us with some of your feedback about today's session, we'll be sending out a survey after today's session. If you could fill that out, that'd be really appreciated. We'd love to hear what you guys think and improve on what you've said. Um, and also, we do have another lecture, which will be looking at UCL's groundbreaking research into treating cancer patients with CAR T-cell therapy, a really cutting edge new piece of science there. And this lecture will be taking place in the new year at 5 p.m. on the 25th of January with our very own Dr. Claire, Claire Roddy, who is a consultant hematologist. We would love to see as many of you there as possible and the details for this event will be sent out to you and how to register will be available on our website shortly. But thank you again for all your comments, guys, and your questions today. Thank you to Professor Song. And again, I hope you guys enjoyed your lecture and I hope you guys have a great evening. Any final questions? We can, I think we can take one more before we go. If there's any in the chat. Mm, no, I think that's it. So thank you guys again very much for joining us today and have a lovely evening.
Thank you.